So um, first of all, I would like to thank the Sea City Museum for this meeting is being recorded. Yeah, for inviting me for this talk, and uh, I did quite a lot of research. I met a lot of people. Some people I never know that they are still here, and and then I managed to get some interesting stories, which is um what I'm going to share with you now. Yeah. So this is the history of the Chinese community in Southampton. <coughs> the central theme is Southampton, but then there are some links with Liverpool, link with London, and so on. Yeah. So let us start from the uh, <coughs> the outline. So first, um, before the Chinese people arrived, there are already some Chinese presence. Yeah, and then I talk about the Chinese records, the the people who are arriving here, and then the migrations, the Chinese association and the school, Chinese arts, Kung Fu, the church, Confucius Institute partnership and the collaborations. So first question for you is that. What is the first Chinese present? Do you think it's the Chinese tea? Some people say it's a Chinese book, but actually, some people say it's a gunpowder. Yeah. So gunpowder was invented by accident in the olden day when the Chinese people trying to find the medicine for eternal life. So the king basically invested a lot of money, a lot of manpower to find the medicine. When they try to do the medicine. Sometimes explosion happens when they mix different uh, materials, and that's where the gunpowder comes about. Yeah. So the first uh, confirmed reference to the gunpowder in China is eight hundred and eight. Yeah. And then later on, the Muslim get the knowledge about the gunpowder somewhere in between the twelve hundred forty thousand eighty, and then the oldest written re recipes of the gunpowder in Europe were recorded by Mark the Greek in between twelve eighty and. 1300s in a book of fires, and then by the time 1346, the Tower of London are already trying to get some to manufacture some gunpowder. So I think that would be the uh, first presence of the Chinese. <coughs> and then the second one is definitely the tea. Yeah, so we have a cup of tea all all the time, and then sometimes we call tea, sometimes we call cha. Yeah, it depends on where the tea comes about. So um, according to the legends, the tea was discovered by the Chinese Emperor Shenlong in 2737 BC. That is long, long time ago. Yeah. So basically, a leaf fell onto his boiling water, and they found that having the leaf there made the tea um, taste better, and also helped him to keep alert. And then, uh, for the for the next few thousand years. The Chinese people have basically done a lot of research. They find out, to try to find out what are the best leaf that can be used for the tea, and actually it was a medical drink. Yeah, so it was first labeled as a medical drink in the sixteen hundred and for sixteen forty one by the Dutch physicians. Okay, so green tea exported from China was first introduced in the coffee house in London, shortly before the sixteen sixty Stuart restorations. So that is very early. So I would say, yeah, after the gunpowder, the tea arrived. And at at that time, tea is, is very expensive. So only the aristocrat, aristocrats and the middle class are able to, to get it. And later on, it become more and more common, and then everybody can get a cup of tea. So that's why the slide is here, because I believe that eventually the tea come to Southampton. Yeah, before the Chinese people arrive, the tea come to Southampton first. It was so popular that by 1766, the export from Canton, Canton is basically in China, is go to six million pounds on the British boats. Yeah, so you can see that it's very popular. Right then, the next person is basically a Chinese man. So the first Chinese person that arrived in in UK, yeah, this island, is basically a person from Nanjing. He is a convert to Catholicism. And he was brought to Europe by the Flemish Jesuit priest Philippe Couplet. Okay, and his name, yeah, it's a long name here. It's Michael Alphonsus Sun Fu Zhong. Yeah, the proper pronunciation is Sun Fu Zhong. So, uh, basically, um, he visited the King James the Two in 1687, and he was the first Chinese man to visit Britain. <coughs> At that time. Um, Chinese was very welcome, so uh, a lot of curiosity about Chinese. 
So the King James II was very delighted to have uh, Mr. Sun's visit, and he had his portrait made and hung it in his bedroom. So this is the portrait that was made, yeah, in, in, in that time, yeah, 1687, and it was in. Uh, uh, Mr. Shen arrived. You already have a record here that basically Mr. Mr. Shen helped to catalog the yeah, uh, Bodleian Library. So that means that uh, before he arrived, the Chinese book arrived first. Yeah, so you have the gunpowder, you have the Chinese tea, you have the Chinese book, and eventually you have the Chinese person. <coughs> right, and then now talk about Chinese people now. Yeah. So in the early 19th century, the Chinese seamen were employed in the tea trade. Yeah. As we mentioned earlier, tea was very popular. So it, the tea trade is also very, uh, very profiting. So the East India Company ship, yeah, so they're having, having the tea trade. So they began to temporarily lodging in London. So these seamen come around in UK and they basically lodged temporarily in London. And a Chinese man called John Anthony was brought to London in 17. 99 by the East Indian Company to provide accommodation yeah, for the Laska and Chinese sailors in the Angel Gardens. Yeah, so that is basically uh, the first time that a group of Chinese people are arriving. The first presence of Chinese people in London, uh, sorry, in Liverpool, dates back to 1834 when the first directly from China arrived in, London, in Liverpool's docks for, again, it's for business. Yeah? So for the silk and the cotton wool, that is basically a very popular thing that uh, people try to get from China. And then the Chinese immigrants first arrived in Liverpool in the late 1860s as a result of the Alfred Holt and company employing a large number of Chinese seamen while establishing the Blue Funnel shipping line. Yeah, so I can see that this is the photo in uh, 1895 when the Chinese people were recruited by the East Indian uh, company to work on the ships yeah basically it's a, to do the tea, tea trade so something happened in between 18 to 1860 so as you can see that it, at the beginning chinese are very welcome yeah you welcome the chinese person you welcome, welcome the chinese tea and you like the book but something happened yeah so because of time i'm not going to go into details because this talk i got 69 slides and i need to deliver in uh, 15 minutes so in brief, Opium War happens. Yeah? So 1839 to 1842, the first Opium War. The second Opium War is uh, finished in 1860. So I can see that this is 1860. Yeah? So at that time, Opium War already happened. Because of war, sometimes people demonize each other. Yeah? So that is time, I think, that is uh, when the West started to basically have some discrimination on the Chinese people. Yeah? So from being welcome, they have been uh, uh, discriminated. And also at that time, um, the next bus, the next things that arrive in the UK is basically the Chinese junk, yeah, the keying. So keying is three mustard, 800 ton Fuzhou Chinese trading junk. Yeah? So basically it sailed from China in 1846. And at that time, the Chinese government forbid yeah, this uh, ship from being sold to non-Chinese. So basically, it was bought in secret yeah, by the British businessman in Hong Kong in 1846. So it was uh, illegally bought. Yeah? And then it traveled around the world. First, it go to New York in 1847. And then it arrived in Britain in March 1848. So a medal was made in honor of the arrival. So this Chinese junk is basically the most advanced ship at that time. The most advanced ship. Yeah? And then... 64 years later, you have the Titanic. Yeah, from 1848 to 1912 is basically one generation. So in one generation time, the British basically has been working very hard. So basically they learn from everywhere. They basically look at the junk, Chinese junk as well. <coughs> and also they invented a lot of uh, motor as well. Yeah? So basically you can see yeah, a lot of improvement have been done. So 64 years later, you have the Titanic. It was regarded as the most advanced ship at, at that time and now we go to titanic yeah so the sea city museum used to be called the titanic titanic museum for a reason yeah so basically because titanic sailed off on the 10th of april 1912 to new york from southampton 
So basically from Southampton, yeah, you go to Sherbrooke and then you go to Queenstown and then go to New York. But before arriving at New York, something happened. Yeah, it was sink. It was sunk there. Yeah. So there are 2,435 passengers. My, my second question for you is how many of them are Chinese? Okay. So it turned out that there are eight Chinese people that pay the third class Chinese passenger, uh, third class fee yeah, for the, 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 uh, the ticket. So there are fee paying passengers yeah, to get a third class also is quite expensive at that time. Yeah? So basically they were believed to be professional sailors. Yeah? They are heading to the Caribbean for work. And because uh, Titanic sailed off from uh, Southampton, it is very likely that maybe these three person, this eight person, maybe they come down and have a cup of tea in Southampton. Yeah, so that is why the slide is here. Yeah, we have uh, I put that in, into here because um, it, there is a link with the Southampton. So when the Titanic sank on a cold night in 1912, there are only one third of the people alive, survived. Yeah, only 700 people escaped. Only one of the lifeboats escaped turn back to search for the potential survivor. So this is basically, uh, if you look at the movie by Titanic, this is basically uh, the scene when the boat come back and they found the survivor. But in real life, this happened. So in darkness, they found a Chinese man, Mr. Fang Lang, clinging on a wooden door, yeah, shivering, but still alive. So he was uh, basically uh, rescued. So there are six Chinese survivors. So the name are basically here. Yeah? So Li Ping, Fang Lang, Chang Chip, Alam, Chong Fu and Ling He. So out of the eight, six of them survived. But the thing is that as I mentioned earlier, Opium War, yeah. So because of Opium War, the discrimination happened. So all Titanic survivors received praise in the in the press, but these six survivors basically basically disappeared from the history. They didn't receive any praise. So what happened to them? Yeah. So the anti Chinese sentiment is quite high. Yeah, in the West, especially in the USA in the early 20th century. Yeah. So within 24 hours of their arrival at the immigration inspection station in uh, Ellis Island at New York, they were, instead of being welcomed and praised, they were expelled from the country because of a very controversial law, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Basically, it uh, barred the immigration of Chinese people into the US. Yeah, so Unfortunately, yeah. So they were sent to Cuba and then to the UK. Why to the UK? Because there is a shortage of sailors. Many British sailors were enlisted in the army during the World War One. So basically, uh, you need some levels. So what happened then is that uh, Mr. Chang Chip passed away from pneumonia, yeah, because of the uh, event, in the Titanic event. So he passed away in 1914. The, the remaining five worked in Britain until 1920. And then something happened again. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the Brit uh, Britain suffered from post-war recessions, and then anti-immigrant feelings were running high. Yeah. So anti-immigrant is not on only for Chinese, but it's also for other people as well. So an anti-immigrant policy forced them, these five people, to depart from Britain. Unfortunately, yeah, they already married with some uh, English wife, so without notice, they have to leave leave their wife and their children. So that is very unfortunate. So Mr. Alam was deported to Hong Kong. Mr. Ling He go to India. Mr. Li Ping go to Canada. Mr. Fang Lang has been sailing between uh, Britain and Hong Kong. And eventually he became the citizen of the country that rejected him. He became the citizen of the US. Yeah, so this is a, <coughs> a little bit unfortunate. Yeah. So there is a movie called The Six coming up. Yeah. So Maybe in a few time, a few months time, uh, the movie will be shown in Southampton. Then you can go and watch the movie. Right, and then this is um, <coughs> so you have the Titanic, yeah, in uh, nineteen twelve, and then five years later, nineteen seventeen, something happened. Eighty four thousand Chinese men arrived on the key side of Liverpool, or to the Plymouth, yeah. They go to Liverpool or go to Plymouth, and then they continue through the English Channel. So this is the English Channel, passing Southampton, 
We are not sure whether they stop stop over in Simonton or not, yeah, because the record cannot be found. But it passed over and then it go to focal stone before they go to front. So my, my next question is that why do we have so many Chinese people? Where are they what are they doing? It turns out that there is a reason behind, yeah. So this is called the Chinese Labour Corp, CLC. It was a force of workers recruited by the British government in the First World War. So the First World War is 1914 to 1918. And they are recruited to free the troops for, for the frontline duty by performing support work and annual labor. Yeah, so basically uh, not enough labor, so they need to recruit more people. And 96,000 men were recruited into the Chinese Labor Corp and about 140,000 Chinese men served the British and the French. So the French also em employed the Chinese people as well. Yeah? So the British employed this much. In total, you have this. And uh, before the war ended, so you have so many people yeah, from China coming here to help uh, to, to fight the war. So in April 1917, the first contingent of the CLC arrived at the West Port Front. So they left Way Highway Port in January. And then three months of, after that, April, they arrived. So the initial route was by ship. They have two directions. One is going through the African Cape. The other one is through the Panama Canal. But the problem is that it's a long journey, a very, very long journey. And that leads to a lot of sickness. So a lot of people died yeah, before they arrived. So therefore, the solution was that we want to, they want to break the journey. Yeah, break, break the journey, have some rest. And they also go through Canada. Yeah? And then they become the option. That's why here, the previous slide, yeah, the people coming from Canada, or go to Canada, go to Port Plymouth, or Canada, go to Liverpool. So 84,000 of them arriving here, and then they pass through Southampton to focus home. So what do they do? They have to do all the dirty work. Yeah? For example, on the left hand side, you can see that they have the load 9.2 inch of sail. You can see this is quite big, is it? Onto the railway wagon <coughs> yeah? for the transport to the front line. That is taken in 1917. And all the photo can basically found from the link here. Yeah? And the load food as well, yeah? oats onto the lorry. Yeah? Supervised by the British official. Yeah? So basically they have to work quite a lot. And in uh, 1919, 80,000 of them are still work at, at, are still at work. Yeah, although the war finished in 18, 1918, but they are still working in the May 1919. Yeah, so I can see that they have been working very hard. Yeah, to, to, as a labor. <coughs> and the thing about this is that um, these are supposed to be secret. Yeah, so um. I'm not sure why what's the reason, but it's supposed to be a secret. So when they arrive at Liverpool, the Liverpool do not publish any newspaper. But this news is quite common because they go through the Canada. Yeah. And then not many people know about this. Yeah. So and then hundred years later, yeah, 1917 to 2017, finally, yeah, the Chinese Labour Corp of World War II will remember in the UK after 100 years. Another reason for that is that um when they do the painting in, in France, instead of painting the Chinese Labour Corp, they basically uh, remove the painting and they put in America. So basically they were written off from the history. And luckily we got people who are good in research and they found out this thing. Yeah? So 100 years later, they will remember. So they are contributing quite a lot in the World War I. Okay, now we talk about the uh, migrations. So the British East India Company controlled the importation of popular Chinese commodity like tea, ceramic, and silks. Okay, so in the 19th century, the Chinese seamen were uh, being employed, and those who crew ships to Britain had to spend time in the British dock. Yeah, while waiting for the ship to return to China, so they have to wait. Yeah, it's not like the aeroplane. Yeah, every uh, few hours you got one. At that time, you have to wait for a few months. And that's where they established the Chinatowns in Liverpool and also in London. Okay, so we talk about World War One now. World War Two, in World War Two, nineteen thirty nine to nineteen forty five, again twenty thousand Chinese seamen, yeah, were employed working in the shipping industry near uh, in, in Liverpool. So 
they are not doing in the front line like the Chinese labor corps, but they are still contributing. They kept the British merchant navy afloat and keep the people of Britain fuel and fat because the Nazis have been trying to chop off the country's supply line. Yeah, so basically thanks to these 20,000 Chinese seamen, yeah, we, we are, the Britain is in a better shape. Right, then again, after the World War II, yeah, something happened again. The British government and the shipping companies colluded in secret. Yeah, they have a secret meeting. Yeah, and then they agree with a secret deportation. So they force, forcibly deport thousands of the Chinese seamen. So you can see that you got 20,000, right? So a lot of them were deported. Yeah, back to other other kind other places yeah so again yeah so 20,000 Chinese seamen arrived in UK there was no Chinese woman there right so you could expect that if they stay here they would marry yeah they would marry the English wife so when they were deported their British wife and mixed race children didn't know what happened they thought that their father suddenly disappeared they were very angry yeah until recently they, they found out that actually the father was deported in secret. It's not that they want to leave, but basically uh, the government and the companies yeah, secretly deporting them back to other other countries, yeah, like Singapore or some go to Hong Kong, some go to China. Yeah. So what happened if the father is gone? Yeah, the breadwinner deport deported. Many of the seamen children recall going to bed hungry, crammed into just one or two rooms, surviving on the kindness of friends. So I was understand that uh, at that time, the British wife, they cannot claim for benefit. Yeah, if they claim for benefit because they're married to the Chinese person, they cannot get the benefit. Yeah, so that is very uh, difficult for them. And this year, 2021, is a 75th uh, anniversary <coughs> of the deportation. And the <coughs> MP of the Liverpool Riverside, King Johnson, Kim Johnson, yeah, welcomed the new year in February by calling on the Home Office to apologize to the family. Yeah, so I mean, it's secret, although it's legal, but it's secret. Yeah, so although by law it's legal, but then by now, a lot of things that is legal is become illegal. Now, yeah, so that is uh, another sad, sad story. <coughs> right, in the US and UK, most Chinese men run laundry businesses. So why do they do laundry business? Yeah especially at the end of World War II. Yeah? So they turn into laundry because they have no other choice. First, they do not have English skill. They have no money. Yeah? And then they cannot go for mining, fishing, farming, or manufacturing. So what can they do is they do something that the women's work, yeah? ironing and washing. That is a low status job. Do not pose any threat to the British male workers. Yeah? So that is the only, work, only way that they can survive. So the Chinese laundry was a privately owned family enterprise, which provide an opportunity for the family to work in and run a small business. <coughs> right, so this is a famous person, yeah. So during my research, I found this photo from Mr. Ngan, yeah. So Mr. Mr. Ngan Ji Ngan Ji Peng, yeah, Yan Zi Ping, is one of the Chinese seamen in Liverpool. Okay, so fortunately he was not deported, yeah. So he basically moved to Southampton in the late. 1940s with his English wife and they run laund Chinese laundry at Southampton. So unfortunately he passed away in uh, 1985, yeah, so a long time ago now. So um, from um, the interview that I found that to the people, so they told, told me that most Chinese people switched to the Chinese restaurant in the 1960s instead of working on the Chinese laundry. So that is a very hard job, yeah, Chinese laundry. So eventually they got, they got money, they can buy the building and they can run the Chinese restaurant. <coughs> but Chinese restaurant is quite expensive because they need a big space. So in the 70 or 70s, they prefer to open Chinese takeaway. That's why now you can see that there are quite a lot of Chinese takeaway, yeah, even in Southampton. <coughs> so um so Mr. Ngan, yeah, Mr. Ngan, his nephew, yeah. His nephew is another Ngan, yeah, Mr. Ngan Chiman. Ngan Chiman, yeah. So in the Chinese writing, we put a surname in the front, yeah. So it is Ngan here. So this is his nephew. His nephew and his wife also migrated to Southampton with the help of the uncle, yeah, Mr. Ngan Chi Peng. 
in uh, late 1940s. So they work at their uncle's Chinese laundry shop until they have money <coughs> to own to open their own Chinese restaurant yeah, in 1960s. So in the olden day, they have a camp by the ship. The ship go to Liverpool and then they might, they have moved down to Southampton. Yeah, so this is second Mr. Ngan, yeah, and his wife uh, ran the Chinese takeaway in the 70s. There are three sons who were born in Southampton, yeah, so these are three handsome guys. And at that time, you see, they're getting older. Yeah. So <coughs> both of them are still alive, actually. Yeah. And you can see the dark shop, yeah, Chinese hot meal to take away. <coughs> so this is uh, basically the, uh, the brother, the brother of, of uh, Ngan Ji Man. Yeah. So the brother is called Ngan Ji Wun. He also migrates to Saiyan in the 60s, in the, uh, 1973. So he and his wife also run Chinese catering business and they have two sons. Yeah? One work at the law firms, one work at the animation graphic designer. So you can find that actually, although they have a difficult life, the education was very important. So they make sure that the kids have a good, good education and most of them go to university and very successful and contributing to the society. So this is the Hong Kong Chinese restaurant yeah? owned by uh, this third Mr. Ngan. <coughs> right. So ha, ha, look at this uh, beautiful lady, Mrs. Ngan. Yeah, that was a long time ago. And last week when I go to talk to her, this is his her photo now. Yeah? So you can see that time flies so quickly. So Mrs. Ngan told me that life in the Chinese catering business is very tough. Yeah? So most of them work seven days a week, 12 to 12, 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. Take away the minus, the tidy up time, preparation time, they have very little time to sleep. <coughs> and their life is basically between two heads, yeah? the pillow head and the oven head. When they sleep, they go to the pillow. When they wake up, they go to the oven. So in the Cantonese, they say, fan jok zam pao, fan seng lo tao. Yeah? So you sleep on the pillow, you wake up, you go to the oven. They have two major problems. First thing is the lack of bean sprout. Bean sprout is very hard to plant. Yeah? And there's no way that you can buy bean sprout at that time. So all the Chinese restaurants or takeaway, they have to plant bean sprout by their own. Yeah? And that is very difficult to do because it depends on temperature. Yeah? So you need to have the heating yeah? to, to plant the, the bean sprout. So this is a sentence that uh, Mr. Singan told me. Taking care of the bean sprout is even harder than taking care of the parents. In Cantonese, he's saying, Foxy Nga Choi, yeah, so it's very interesting. And the second thing is that the oven is very hot and it's very hard to clean. Yeah, so there are two problems. So as you all know, when there is a difficulty, a problem, then there comes the opportunity. If you can solve these two problems, then you can become very rich. Yeah? So let us see the first person to solve the first problem. So Mr. Peter Chang, yeah, is my good friend. He migrated from Hong Kong to Britain in 19... 58. He did many businesses in London, in Bristol, Cornwall. Eventually, he settled down at Southampton. He was the director of a catering equipment company called the Overseas Distribution Limited. Yeah? So he retired in 1999. And this is a photo of his, of his company. And this is the, basically the catering equipment. So he's not only a salesman, yeah? he invented things as well. So he invented an oven with the water flowing along the oven. Yeah? So therefore, it is easier to clean and it's not too hot. So that was the first solution. Yeah, as I said earlier, too hot, hard to clean. If you can find an oven that can solve this problem, you'll be rich. And therefore, my friend Mr. Peter Chang is a rich guy. Yeah, he owns a company, and he also he is still active. Yeah, so this is a photo that I, that was taken uh, last week. He's still active in the local Chinese church, Chinese association, and the Chamber of Commerce. He was in the Chamber of Commerce for more than ten years. He was also involved in the establishment of the Southampton Qingdao Training Link, which I'm going to go into in a little bit more detail later. And the second person that, that solved the problem is uh, Mr. Raymond Yao. Yeah? He is the boss of the uh, Yao's brothers. He basically grew the bean sprout. Initially, um, he migrated to UK in the 60s, worked as a waiter in in London, and then later on, he and his wife settled at Southampton in 1970. Mr. and Mrs. Yao started the Chinese takeaway in St. Daniel, Southampton in the 70s. And then, as any other Chinese takeaway shop owner, they have to grow the bean sprout. But they grow it in a big quantity. 
until they were so successful, successful that they can sell the green sprout to other takeaways. Okay, and then green sprout is very very uh very important for the Chinese uh food. Yeah, so the business grew into the largest Chinese grocery shop in Southampton called the Yao Gardens <coughs> and Company Limited. Yeah, it was incorporated in 1984. Yeah, this is Yao Gardens. <coughs> yeah, so this is a a photo. Yeah, given by his son. Newspaper published in 1997. So you can see that tons of bean sprouts in Southampton was produced by Mr. Raymond Yao. Yeah. So he solved the problem and therefore he is widely yeah, one of the richest person in Southampton. And this is the internal view of the Yao Brothers shop. The photo was taken in 2020. <coughs> right, so this is another good friend of mine. So war happened, yeah. The Opium War and then Vietnam War, yeah, it finished in 1975. During 1975 to 19, 1995, there were a mass exodus of Vietnamese people. Yeah, they come to UK, Europe, some go to USA. So Mr. Chan Win Lee is a Chinese Vietnamese. So his family and a few other Vietnamese people arrived <coughs> at Gosport in 1979, <coughs> and they settled at East Lee, since uh, 1980. So both of them, yeah, so the handsome man here and the beautiful wife here, both of them already did the chemical engineering degree from Vietnam University. Yeah. But when they arrive in the UK, they have to redo the degree. First, then they need to learn the English and then they have to do the de degree again. So after that, they have been working, contributing into the uh, local engineering company since then. Yeah. So this is a photo of the <coughs> Vietnamese boat people. Right, and then in the 80s onwards, there have been a lot of Chinese students and scholars coming to UK and Southampton to study. They go to university. For example, uh, Professor Sheng Chen, Professor Chen, yeah, is basically my colleague. He come to UK in the 80s. Yeah, he already got a degree, and then he he get, uh, study for PhD degree in control engineering uh, from the City University of London in 1986. And then he became lecturer at Portsmouth University and other university. Eventually, he joined the University of Southampton as a lecturer in 1999. <coughs> he is the professor in intelligence system and signal processing at the University of Southampton, and he is one of the highly cited researchers in the engineering category. Yeah, uh, since uh, 2004, and he was elected as a fellow of UK Royal Academy of Engineering in 2014. So you can see that from the 80s, yeah. A lot of people come here, they are no longer seamen, they are no longer uh, <coughs> uh, because of war, yeah? because they come here to study. And a lot of them, they stay and contribute to the, to the society. For example, he has been contributing a lot to the University of Southampton. <coughs> At the moment, how many Chinese students are there? Yeah? So there are 216,000 Chinese students currently studying in the UK University, according to the Chinese Embassy's data in the UK. Yeah? So, 216,000 is only 0.015% of the 1.4 billion population in China. So you might think that uh, so many people are coming here, but actually it's a very small percentage. It's just that in China, there are so many people. Yeah, it's, it's the, the area is as, as big as Europe, yeah? and the population size is big. And in Southampton alone, you have about 3,000. Yeah? So this is a photo that was taken uh, in uh, last year when we have the fundraising. Yeah, fundraising. Right, now we go to the Chinese Association and the school now. Right, so there was a first Chinese Association before the color one. In the 80s, there was a group of local Chinese people who started the first Chinese Association. Actually, education is very important for the Chinese. So they started the association and the Chinese school at the same time. Yeah. So at that time, most of them are from Hong Kong. Yeah. And therefore, they basically teach uh, Cantonese in the school. The first chairperson, is Mr. Eric Lo, Lo Manchu. And there are many leaders, including Man In Fong, John Se, Michael Leong, Lam Sok, yeah, Liu Lam. So Liu Lam is still a member of the association. He's 90 plus years old already. And then uh, there was no funding. So basically, how can they run the, the association and the school? Basically, they were supported by the Chinese restaurants and business. So one of the aim is to set up a Chinese school. So let us move on to the uh, before that, yeah, 
So before the Chinese school, there are something that happened in the Chinese association. The first association how many events, especially like the Chinese New Year, and this is yeah this is Mrs. Singan yeah when when she was young with the kids and the, and the husband. So in the eighties they attended one of the events. So this is the event that they have yeah. I'm not sure whether it's Chinese New Year or whether it's a Mid Autumn Festival. It could also be a Christmas yeah. So they have events there. And then um, the first Chinese association only ran for a few years, you know, for, for many other reasons, so it didn't continue. But the Chinese community leaders, yeah, they continue to work with their local council. Yeah? For example, Lam Sok yeah, is here, the boss of, uh, this is Raymond Lau, Le Raymond Yao, yeah, the boss of Yao Brothers. This is uh, Mr. Ngan, yeah, you can see that. And all these are uh, the Lion Dance group, yeah? they, they, they were having a fun yeah, with the mayor in one of the Chinese New Year. Right now, first Chinese school, yeah. So the the eighties, uh, uh, most of the local Chinese people are from Hong Kong, so they have a lot of children, yeah. So the the Cantonese Chinese was basically taught in the uh, first Chinese school. There are about hundred pupils, yeah, maybe slightly lower, but about hundred. At Saint Mary School, yeah, the head teacher, the first one I was told is Mr. Lawrence Ng. The teacher. Are uh, mostly university students. Yeah, as I said early in the eighties, a lot of people come to the university to study. In their spare time, they go volunteer their time to teach the uh, language to their to the local Chinese uh, children. And then later on, it uh, first it was a uh, it was taught on Sunday. Later on, it moved to Saturday, and it was moved to Mount Pleasant School. And I was also told that interestingly, uh, some of these students are very talented. The university students. Yeah? So they become the teacher, and they also teach the kids Chinese Kung Fu as well, yeah, for exercise. <coughs> so even though the association uh, stopped earlier, but the first Chinese school continued, yeah, it ran until the 90s. And the last head teacher was uh, Miss Jenny Fong, yeah, I also talked to her the other day. <coughs> right, now in the 90s, there are increasing number of Chinese people that speak Mandarin, yeah. So um, from mainland China or from other part of the world, they speak Mandarin, and a lot of them come as a student as well, <coughs> and that they, they have children. Yeah, so there is a need to create a Chinese school that can accommodate the teaching of both the Mandarin and the Cantonese language. So a group of Chinese uh, people started the Chinese Southern Chinese School in 1998 to teach the languages. Yeah, it's on Saturday from one to three p.m. at Tandil School. <coughs> the first head teacher was. Mr. Chong, and the current head teacher is uh, Dr. Yu Jing Lu. Yeah, Yu Jing Lu. So um, as of 2021, so because I'm the deputy head teacher, eh, so there are, I know that there are 14 classes covering 10 different levels, and there are about very close to 200 pupils. The highest level used to be A level, but now we basically change to GCIC Mandarin. So our pupils can go for the GCIC exam. <coughs> Over the many years, we always have very good uh, Mandarin result in the GCIC exam. Yeah, that's something that we are very proud of. And uh, one of the very famous teacher and the governor is basically Mrs. Winnie Tang. So he re she received the excellent Chinese teacher teacher award by the UK Association for Promotion of Chinese Education. So he got the award. She got the award in two thousand six. Yeah, and then she also um get the award. For the excellent overseas Chinese teacher award, yeah, from the Chinese government in twenty eleven. So this is a photo here. Okay, so he got a lot of award as uh, one of the very good teachers. And I also know that he was uh, nominated, yeah, by the previous chairperson of the association to be the excellent mom as well. Yeah, and this is a photo that was taken. Yeah, I was sitting here, yeah, so controlling the overhead projector. There was a year end celebration in July twenty eighteen. <coughs> Right now we go to the Chinese association of Southampton. So in the nineties, the Chinese population has increased further with lots of Chinese people from China, yeah, mainland of Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, and etc. <coughs> and because the first one died off, yeah, quite earlier, so they started to prepare for the association. Yeah, starting from nineteen ninety eight, and then uh, the Chinese association of Southampton was established officially in nineteen ninety nine. So the three objectives of the association was first. <coughs> to promote the Chinese art and cultural tradition to the public, to improve the quality of life of the Chinese people in and around the city, <coughs> to
to actively en encourage our member to seek better understanding of other culture as well. Yeah, so we are not close. Yeah, basically we want to <coughs> share our culture at the same time we want to understand other people as well. And these are the uh, list of uh, chairperson. Yeah, so the first person is uh, Dr. Jack Cheung. He was a researcher at the University of London. And then the second chairperson is uh, Mrs. Ellie Wong. He worked at the council. And the third one is Dr. Ping Hua. She is the longest serving chairperson, yeah? nine years. It's a long time, contributed a lot to the association. And the next person is Mr. Andy Lai, and then Mr. Joe Hong, <coughs> and to me. Yeah? So I have been a chairperson since 2016. Yeah? I'm the youngest among all of them. I'm still learning a lot of things from them. <coughs> and uh, it was established in uh, 1999. So by 2019 is the 20 years anniversary celebration. So that was the celebration that we have. Yeah. So we have the uh, mayor, we have people from China, and also a community leader as well. Yeah. So that was the so. <coughs> and then um, yeah, we have annual Chinese New Year. So normally we do it in the university. Yeah, you have the mayor here, a professor from the University of Southampton, <coughs> performer, and other people. <coughs> and then we also sometimes have a celebration at the Guild Hall Square. And this is the Lion Dun. <coughs> and in 2019, we also have the London London Parade. Yeah? The London Parade go through the southern city, including uh, Tai Chi. So I was here. Yeah? So these are my, my friend and student. So we did Tai Chi and then we do the uh, dragon dance and also the lion dance. And you can see that there are a lot of balloons here. Yeah? So Dr. Pinghua was also helping yeah, by uh, making some balloon and some artworks. So basically we all work together and the event was very successful. <coughs> right, so Chinese Association is not just about celebration, not just about telling other people about what we do, we also contribute. For example, um, we have a fundraising campaign in 2020 to fight against the pandemic. So with the help of the city council, yeah, with the mayor helping us as well, and also supporter from Southampton and abroad, we managed to obtain medical supplies that worth thirteen thousand plus, yeah. And we we donate all the uh, medical supplies to the hospital in China and also the NHS in Southampton. So these are all the students that involved, yeah. And this is our committee member last year. <coughs> right, let us move on, yeah. So we have only a five five more minutes. So Chinese arts, yeah, the uh, before the association was established in nineteen ninety nine. The leaders are already helping with uh, uh, popularizing and sharing our Chinese art. So you can see here, yeah. So Mrs. Tang, yeah, Gan Tai, yeah, and uh, even my friend uh, Chan is here. And Chinese Association of Sahamda is a platform for many groups and also for individuals to share the Chinese culture and arts to the to the public. Yeah. So we have singing group, we have dancing group, yeah, and then yeah. Our previous chairperson, yeah, Ms. Dr. Pinghua. So he established the Phoenix Arts Group one year after the, the association. It's 2000. Yeah? So, and then uh, she has been helping the association, promoting and teaching the Chinese art. And the arts group was renamed as Chinese Art Science in 2012. <coughs> okay, water side lion dance. The, what, the lion dance that you see, and the big dragon that you see, yeah, so basically it's come from them. So it was established by uh, Mr. Ricky Tang in 21. Yeah? So they do a lot of uh, very professional lion dance performance. And the Chinese Kung Fu, right? So Master Tay, the one, the young man standing here, yeah, is, is my, my teacher basically. And the, he basically came to London to study at the university in 1977. And then by 1979, he started to come down to Southampton to teach the Kung Fu. And he started a kung fu a kung fu school in 1979 in Southampton, and with the uh, permission from Grandmaster Liu, <coughs> it was called Wu Tan Kung Fu School. So Wu Tan, what is so special about Wu Tan? Yeah. So let us uh, go back to a little bit history. Yeah. So Grandmaster Li Li Su Wen is one of the one of China's greatest master artists. So he got many disciples and students. So his, his students become the bodyguards of the last emperor of China, yeah, Mao Zedong of, the, of China, Jiang Kai-shek of Taiwan. Yeah. And then um, one of the students of Mr. Grandmaster Li is Liu Yuanchao. So Liu Yuanchao was a disciple of, of uh, Master Li. 
is also is also the chairperson of the civil defense force in the Republic of China, and he when he retired, he formed the Wu Tan Kung Fu School in Taiwan, 1966. So that was the first Wu Tan School, and the Wu Tan School in in Southampton was in here, yeah, 70 or 80s. And then Master Wu Wu Songfa, basically uh, a disciple of Master Liu, and then Wu Songfa become the teacher of Master Tai, yeah, and then Master Tai basically come to UK, open the school, and you will call the Wu Tan School. So you can see that it's a long history of all the Grand Master. <coughs> right, so it's, it's, it has been there for a long time, and then it's teaching Tai Chi, Wing Chun, Chao Le Fa, 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 Di, Fa Di Quan, and many others. And uh, over the years, there have been many medalists. They won a medal in the Kung Fu Championship yeah, in UK, Europe, and China. And this is my son, he got uh, three medals in one of the championships in 2017. And again, you also have the UK Shaolin Temple, you also have Park Mei Kung Fu, many different Kung Fu schools. Okay? So this is the uh, UK Shaolin Temple <coughs> established by Master Si Yan Ning in uh, 2003 and moved, then moved to Siamton in 2016. Yeah? And they are also giving a very good performance. Yeah, this is one of the performance in the Chinese uh, Association. And this is the Park Mei. Park Mei Kung Fu was, yeah, so this was a video taken in 1992. So there are many Kung Fu schools in UK as well, in Southampton. Chinese Church, yeah. Southampton Chinese Christian Fellowship was established in 1976, and then Southampton Chinese Christian Church in 1996. Yeah, so 20 years a gap, yeah. So both of the uh, organizations are charity organizations. They have been supporting many Chinese Christians at Southampton and surrounding areas. Many Chinese immigrants and students are also benefiting from their organizations. Confucius Institute, yeah. So 2011, Southampton University formally opened the uh, Confucius Institute, yeah. So this is you can see the uh, uh, Vice Chancellor of University, <coughs> former British Ambassador, Chinese Ambassador at that time, and also the President of Xiamen University. Yeah? So this is uh, the gateway to China. So they did a lot of things. They do cultural workshop, for example, those in the Chinese New Year, to performance and also to symposium, yeah, to introduce about China. They basically uh, try to establish and support the provision of opportunity for everybody in Southampton and surrounding areas to study the, all the aspects of modern China, language, culture, from primary school to the university level. So yeah, so this is the picture taken, the director is here, and this is the, all the director <coughs> and the teacher of the Confucius Institute, yeah, uh, recent photo. Right, now move on. So Twin City. So um, Southampton well, developed a twinning link with a uh, Chinese port Qingdao, yeah? well known for Qingdao beer. Qingdao is very big, 30 times bigger than Southampton. Yeah? It's the third largest uh, port in China. So the group of people go to uh, Qingdao in November. And yeah, so you can see uh, the people are here. Yeah? So among the people that go there, there are seven British people there are all eight, eight British people, yeah. One of them is a Chinese, yeah, Mr. Peter Cheng, yeah, the, uh, the, the person that I mentioned earlier. So he's the one, he's the only Chinese person, and he is also one of the two businessmen in the trip. And they are in charge of talking to the, all the business partners in Qingdao. And one month later in December, the Chinese representative come along over and sign the training agreement. <coughs> Right, so here come the golden era. Yeah? So in 2015, the Chancellor George uh, Osborne delivered a speech in Shanghai. And among the many things that he said is that 500 million Chinese citizens have been lifted out of the poverty. And that is the biggest single contribution to making the poverty history in, in his lifetime. Yeah? And he was saying that we want to have a golden era for the UK-China relationship for many years to come. Yeah? So that is 2015. And in 2017, uh, our Mr. Kao, Kao Ji, Ji Sheng, yeah, basically one of the successful businessmen among the 1.4 billion, he's one of the successful ones, and he's a founder and chairperson of the Lander Sports Development Com Company. So before he bought over the football club, the football club was bought over by the Labour's family, yeah, in 2009. At that time, the club almost go into administration, yeah, and then uh, eight years later, Mr. Kao come, come over. I think it's part of the reason uh, because of the invitation in 2015. Two years later, he came over and he spent a lot of money yeah, to buy the 80% of the share. But unfortunately, uh, something 
sometimes it's not 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 go well yeah so by that time when uh, when when uh, the British foreign policy group survey taken in 2021 they found that basically there's upsurge of anti-Chinese sentiment I think because partly because of the 5G network also the pandemic so there have been some uh, <coughs> to, to us it's a misreporting yeah but then it is very uh, uh, from the media yeah so it's a bit uh, unfortunate and then in the G7 the, the US president was calling for aggressive act against China fortunately not all of the European Union are going along yeah so a lot of them prefer focus on the cooperative nature of the relationship I think that is good yeah we want to cooperate rather than uh, demonizing each other because whatever the policy happen it will affect people yeah on the ground people like myself in Southampton will be affected so let me finish off with the famous quote by Bruce Lee under the heaven there is but one family it just so happens that we look different yeah so this is the Chinese word see, see, thank you yeah? so this is the uh, Tai Chi fan uh, yeah, I, was, I was here yeah? so we give a uh, performance for the unity uh, the unity 101 